Thanks very much for inviting me along to speak tonight. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I hope some of my talk doesn't feel as if it's taking my, uh, teaching my granny to suck eggs, but I'll do my best. The things I think you might know quite well, I'll flick through quickly, OK? You can always ask me questions at the end or grab me at the outside. If you can't hear me, just tell me to speak up. I'm not usually problematic at speaking up. OK, so this evening what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the opportunity to tell you a bit about the differential diagnosis and management of back pain. OK, um, I work as an EXP in Glasgow Royal Infirmary. There's eight of us that work within the orthopaedic clinic and we cover all body parts apart from the feet and ankle. We leave that to podiatrists. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly take through the epidemiology and natural history. A lot of you will know all this anyway, but I'm just going to recap on it a wee bit. Some of the causes, because I think it just helps me to refresh right, my clinical reasoning when a patient comes into the clinic, right, where am I going with this, what am I thinking, do we need to, can we offer something to do orthopaedic, or is this something that rheumatologically or at the pain clinic may well be more beneficial for. But I'm going to shoot through that so that I can then go on to the, kind of the differential diagnosis between mechanical, stenosis, nerve root, and I've also put in cervical myelopathy that might seem a bit funny to be in there, but there are actually been a couple of instances in the clinic where I've thought, I don't think this is quite just a back pain here, and how we would manage it. Um, and I'm really not going to go through a lot of the assessment examination because I think <coughs> I'll be running out by time, I'll run, run out of time by then, and I don't think I need to tell you how to assess and examine a lumbar spine. So we all know that back pain is a massive issue. 80% of the population at some point in their life are going to have a problem with it. Okay? It's a massive cost um, to the NHS, about what, £500 million a year. And the cost to industry um, and the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer is well over £5 billion a year. So it's a big problem. Um, and Gordon Waddell um, you know, said that way back in 1998. And that accounts for 5% of GP consults that's quite a lot okay we know with the natural history in the acute episode that comes up it is self-limiting it will get better 92 percent of people will get better within a two-month um, period and that's even if nobody puts their hands on them they just self-manage and they go on with things however 90 percent become recurrent 35 percent will develop this umbrella term of sciatica 10% will become, go on to have persistent uh, back pain. But despite that, only 2 to 3%, the Fraser might correct <coughs> me on this one, only require surgical intervention. So that's a massive 85% of chunk of people that are going to have recurrent back pain throughout their life or throughout a period of their life that don't need any surgery. So that's a big conservative management issue. Um, and I think um, Croft et al, they did a study to look at GP consults. Um, and people are going along for one or two, three sessions with their GP say, I've still got this back pain, I've still got this back pain, and then they didn't go back. And they followed this up a year down the line, and 75% of the people that had presented with the back pain still had problems with back pain on and off. So what do I do in the orthopaedic clinic, apart from trying to keep Eugene Peel right in check and drinking coffee? Well, there's... Um, a team of about four or five, well, there's eight ESPs in total, but there's five of us that uh, dip in and out of the uh, spinal clinics. Um, and we triage all the Sky Gateway referrals that come through to make sure they see the most appropriate person. There's no point in me seeing something that's been really complex. It's had previous fusions. It's better if they go straight to see the consultant. Um, then through the, the process of assessment and examination, you're ruling out your red flags, which I know is going to be in the next talk, so I'm not going to go through that. And then you're deciding from there, what else do we need to do for this person? Does this just need to be discharged? Do they need a bit of um, education about what is going on? Because usually they've been through quite a few <coughs> hoops before they get to um, orthopaedics. Um, and can I decide from there the appropriate fu future management of, or further management, to say, not future management? So does that involve scanning them? Does that involve getting bloods done for, for them if they maybe do think that there is an inflammatory component to this? Um, nerve conduction studies, etc., etc. <coughs> in the clinic, we do see new patients. We see the scan returns. The predominance of the scan returns we see back are the ones that are negative. Um, the positive ones tend to go back to the consultant and the registrar because they're obviously then counselling them on the uh, surgical procedure that could be undertaken. And we see the post-op patients that come back. So. And I do feel quite sorry for the consultants and registrars because they go in and they do the surgery 
and then we see them all back apart from the fusions. Uh, so we see the discectomies and decompressions and 80% of them, oh, it's fantastic, it's fantastic. And there's a small group that don't get any improvement for it. And they're the ones that they see back. So they don't see, I do try to feed back to them that, you know what, that person's had a fantastic response. Leg pain's gone, they're away back to work, everything's fine. Because they do have the heart sink if they see the ones that haven't quite worked back. And I think that can sometimes get on top of nothing's working. Okay, so why does low back pain occur? Why does it occur? It's multifactorial, okay? This is just to kind of fit some of the physical elements that I put down here. Um, you know, the deconditioning, the sedentary lifestyle. I know there's been kind of papers out there like, you know, what the heck has abdominal control got to do with it? But I still think there's, you know, your core and your kinetic chain still has an effect on that. So it's multifactorial. There's not just one thing that causes the back pain. So I guarantee everybody in this room has a predisposing factor at the moment but it's just you're waiting for that precipitating factor to kickstart it all. These things can lead to adaptive changes, disco changes, joint uh, mechanic changes, and then that's going to lead into a process of pain dis and dysfunction. Okay, but the problem comes when you have new use, overuse, you've been out tidying the garden for winter and you've spent five hours out there and you come back in and you've got back discomfort and then you slump down in the sofa and you think, oh, I'll get better. But uh, there is no one cause for back pain. But what I do think, and, and this is me and I hope a lot of you agree, is that you know, if you've got pain and dysfunction, as the pain settles, we all know, it, the, the physios out there in the audience, when somebody's pain settles, they stop doing their exercises and then the pain starts to come back again. So I, I think if you can't maximise their functional range of movement, then they're already putting themselves into that recurrent bracket. Okay. So, and again, this is like teaching your granny to suck eggs. If you look at the basic movements, okay, you've got flexion and extension. I know you have some side gliding and some rotation, but essentially lumbar spine, flexion, extension. So what happens in them? And again, I teach this along to, so you're increasing your posterior disco pressure, you're increasing your central space, your foraminal space and your neural tension. If you go into a more upright position, that's, that's reversing from there. Okay. So some flexion activities, sitting and bending, you know where I'm going with this one, standing and walking into extension. So it's important to remember these things for your clinical reasoning, um, but I think a lot of you already know that as a factor anyway. So now we're getting to the main part of it, which is the, we'll start off with the mechanical back pain. So mechanical back pain, what's the clinical presentation of that? Well, it should be 20 years and plus, okay? If it's less than 20 years, You'd be thinking, if it's a girl, is this something that uh, is a scoliosis that maybe mum and dad haven't picked up because they're going through their grungy years and they've got big baggy t-shirts on? Or is there something sinister going on with this? Or have they just been spending too much, in their too much time in their gaming chair playing their Xbox and their old posture? Okay, so it can be low back pain, it can be referred pain, it's non-dermatome, what's that kind of, what kind of goes down the side of my thigh or down the back of my thigh, doesn't quite reach my knee or just halfway down. There's usually no any paresthesia or numbness, no neurological thing, and it's episodic. Sometimes it can tell you what's triggered it, sometimes it's just been insidious, or they've had an episode of something and then it's settled away, um, but as it's settled away, they've not regained that full functional range of movement, there's just been that wee bit lacking. Okay. So the aggravating and easing factors, they're variable from person to person, okay? It's posture, it's movements, it's daily activities, it's our lifestyle, it's our work. Um, it's whether they do any regular form of exercise as well. Um, there are no red flags, um, negative cough and sneeze, and there's no cord equina signs, symptoms as you're asking them going through the subject of questioning. And if there's repeated episodes like, you know, Quite often you can find that they have an increased frequency of episodes. So instead of, of well, it happened five years ago and then two years ago, but now it happened once last year and it's three times this year. And then they get an elongation of that. They have more severe pain during the episodes and the episodes last longer. Um, and it doesn't really matter what you do as to what causes it. Okay, so the reason I put my dermatome chart in there is don't forget your dermatomes. Your body's just a big jigsaw puzzle and it's putting all the jigsaw pieces together that gives you your working diagnosis and therefore your management for the patient. So they normally have poor posture. 
reduced lordosis. They don't have any form of shift. They do have a reduced range of movement, possibly in one or more directions. And the hard neuro tests are negative. Investigations, well, you wouldn't be doing an x-ray for them anyway, or they may have age-related changes, depending on what age they are. It'd be worth mentioning at this point, I think, that a lot of the patients that come into the orthopaedic clinic, and I don't know what you think about this, phrase is, or even the kind of pain clinic, whatever, they come expecting and wanting an MRI scan now. And I think as much of the consultation is about counselling them in why you would do an MRI scan, the limitations of the MRI scan, and as, as David said, an MRI shows you everything. It's not necessarily clinically relevant. Okay, it's like a mirror and you have to slot the pieces together, what the patient's telling you with their clinical presentation and the MRI findings. It's not the first time that I've had a patient and I'm thinking, right, there's definitely going to be pressure on that L5 nerve root on the left-hand side. And it's as clear as a bell, you could drive a horse and a bus through it, but it's all clogged up on the right-hand side, but they don't have any right leg symptoms. So, you know, you have to balance that up. It's, it's teaching the patient that you can do that. And it's one of the most difficult <laughs> clinics I ever do is the post-op, not the post-op, the post-scan returns. And it's negative. And you've got this patient that is in pain and you have to sit there and you're saying to them, I can understand you're in pain, but there's nothing in your MRI that requires you to have an operation. And then they'll go, but why, why, why? Because they have this expectation that it's going to be it's going to be specifically diagnostic. And it's not diagnostic, it's part of the jigsaw puzzle. So if anyone wants to come and do a scan return clinic with me, feel free. Okay, so what's the management for this? Certainly from an orthopedic point of view, there's nothing we can do to them. And we have to educate them as to that, you know, what is orthopedics about? But there are other things there out there that can help. As I say, there's a thousand different ways to skin a cat. You can, you've got your physio, you've got pain clinic, depending on what the symptoms are and where they are, what do you get on board for these people to help them? Okay, there is little evidence to support uses of modalities, which we know, and bed rest, but there is evidence out there for behaviour therapy, exercise, exercise classes, and education. Okay, so, spinal stenosis. Pathophysiology, again, I'll go through this quite quickly. Okay, it's a narrowing of the central canal and or the lateral foramina. It causes irritation and compression on the cord and then exiting nerve roots, and it could be unilateral or bilaterally. It could be congenital, it can be developmental, but more commonly it's degenerative. And it can involve one or more of what is up there. So it could be facet joint degenerative changes with your ligamental fluid and buckling. So that's all just narrowing up that foraminal area and the central canal as well. And then you get your spondylolisthesis as well and your degenerative scoliosis. So it can be ischemic, it can be degenerative or it can be atrogenic. Ismic tends to be when there is a defect in the pars, interticularis, um, and then that chronicity can cause a degree of slippage. The iatrogenic is from previous surgical interventions, so maybe there's been kind of several levels in the olden days um, that has caused a weakness um, of the pars defect, but that's not that common, would you say now? No, okay, right. <laughs> okay. And remember the normal slip is prevented by the bony block of the facet joints, an intact neural arch and the IV bonding of the vertebral bodies. Okay, so in this one, if you can see it, where's my thing? Down here, okay. There's your, you've got a pars defect there. So that's causing that forward slip, giving that a grade one onto grade two. Okay, it's graded in four, it can be graded one to four. And on this one, there's a grade one slip, probably more just degenerate, okay? And what I would say is, when I was a, a younger physio many years ago, these used to scare, see when somebody said, oh, this person's got spondylitis, it used to scare the living daylights out of me. And I, 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 I know for a while, I did have a bit of fear avoidance of kind of, what can I do with this patient? Can I really, you know, can they really move? Can I push them into different directions? Yes, absolutely. They respond just as well to rehab as other people. You maybe just wouldn't do a grade five manipulation on them. Okay, so who presents with this? They tend to be the older person. Again, males a wee bit more than females. Lower back pain, can't have. Unilateral or bilateral leg pain, it could be radicular or non-dermatomal. 
The pain can be intermittent, as we know, or it can be constant. It tends to be more constant as time has gone on and on and on and it's become more, it's become older and it's become more established, shall I say, I don't really like the word chronic, established. And as I said, it usually becomes episodic, but then it comes constant over time. And it's gradual, insidious onset. There's very rarely one thing that they've gone, Eureka, that's what's caused my problem. So there's my wee man shopping over the trolley. So it can also give you, you know, your neurogenic claudication. You can have a numbness as well as the pain. You can have that feeling of weakness, of tiredness, as of walking on the legs, uh, cramping. Aggravating factors is when they go into that extension, when you're already when your extension already narrowing down that central canal. So if they've got all these degenerative changes going on and a slight spondylolisthesis, which is narrowing it down, you're narrowing it even further. And they tend to like to flex. Okay, so the examination pretty much, I've, a huge percentage of the patients I've ever seen through the clinic, it's unremarkable. You're really making your kind of diagnosis or synopsis from your questioning of the patient, okay? They may have a reduction in movements. They may find that they can flex forward quite well. The really severe ones really struggle. You've probably seen it as well. Even struggle getting into neutral position. It's like, oh, my back, okay? They may not have leg symptoms that come on when you're examining them. And again, the neurological um, examination can be normal. What I do do with this, and this is a good differential diagnosis, is check their circulation because there is a bit of a... I know we kind of, you know, um, we, we refer to rheumatology and pain clinic, but vascular refer to us, we refer to vascular because something can be referred to them by a GP and it's, it's spinal claudicatory symptoms rather than vascular. So check it out, okay? Usually the circulatory component, they just really need to stop the activity for the symptoms to settle, where our guys need to kind of sit down or bend over. And I frequently say, right, how far can you walk? Can they have a difficulty? Right, okay, if we had to walk from Glasgow Royal across to the Canning Gallery, so all the way along, oh no, hen, I couldn't do that, right? If I followed you with a wee chair, where would you have to sit down? And I'll, well, that would be fine. My leg pain would go. And also, um, you know, if you put a, a kind of stenotic person on a bike, they'll be able to cycle away. It's fine. That's not going to give them their leg symptoms because they're all already in a flex position because they're sitting down. Okay. So, x ray could be normal. Could be age-related changes. There could be spondylolisthesis there, and if you need to, calling on and doing an MRI. So here we go. This is one, a lady, one of my colleagues gave me this X-ray. You can see. There we go. Look at the extent of this. Now this is a lady who'd had lower back pain for 25 years, and she has got a grade three going on to a grade four spondylolisthesis. <coughs> So I think when that was explained to her, she thought, oh, thank goodness, you know, is there something that can be done for my pain now? Um, and here is, I've got a couple of MRIs up here as well. I'm just flicking through this. So that kind of shows you on the sagittal image, the, the narrowing and the bunching in that area there. And again, on this level here, you can see there's definitely two levels that can be involved, yeah, possibly a third. Now, again, where this might mean that this patient would be possibly a candidate um, after discussing with the con uh, uh, consultants. Would that be a nerve root block you would do? <coughs> would you do a single level one or could you do a series of nerve root blocks to find out what level was giving the bother? And if there was more than one level, instead of just going in and saying, right, OK, we'll do all two or three levels there, you might find that you don't need to do it. Remember, go back to the MRI. You've got all the MRIs that come back. Take 100 people off the street, give them MRIs. 80 will come back with something on their MRI scan, but only two people need something done about it. So it, it, that's where I think the nerve root blocks come in really nicely. And also, it's quite a good way of, if somebody that doesn't want surgery, of being able to help them, or if they're not fit for surgery, you know, they've got multiple comorbidities going on as well. And again, that's the same patient. This is the level below, so you can see the wide patent central canal. And then on this, you've got the level that the problem is, which is the level above. And you can see that central canal really narrowed up and thickened up. And no wonder they're getting, no wonder they're getting pain there. So what do we do? Well, you can treat them conservatively. You can 
tell them to flex like a maddy and rotate and do core stability and see if that can help them. Sometimes it does, but over a period of time, it'll then get to a stage where it doesn't. Do you, can you use some non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? Can you use an epidural nerve root block to see if you can specify one level that you can deal with? And if surgery is needed, would that go on to do a decompression? Or there are other procedures out there, and one that Mr. Wheelwright was using was an interspinous distraction. So it wasn't a, a formal decompression. It was an next stop procedure where basically it's like a wee jack that's put in between the two posterior spinal processes, so it kind of jacks it up. Okay, so we're getting there. <laughs> um, if we're looking at nerve root discogenic now, lower back pain with radicular leg pain, disc herniation plus or minus, there could be a bit of facet joint hypertrophy there. So how does that happen? Well, it says it there. And the result can be, as my next picture shows, your internal disc disruption, which can go to protrusion, prolapse, extrusion, and your sequestrated fragment from there. Okay. So who presents with this? It should be between kind of 20 and kind of 55. They have radicular leg pain. It can be constant or intermittent. One of the things I always say to them is, okay, what's worse? Is it the back pain or the leg pain? Because any form of intervention that the consultants would be considering doing would be majority for, for leg pain. There's no guarantee in your back pain. There'll be no change in your back pain after the surgery. If there is, that's a brucey bonus. But then if you get rid of the leg pain and they've got a stiff back, then maybe that's our shoe in to start to optimise the movement and start to make an impression on their back discomfort as well. Okay. The paresthesia and numbness should relatively be in a dermatomal distribution. It can be sudden or onset. And again, as I said before, it can be previous episodes that have just been back, you know, back pain, back pain. But the last two years I've been getting some leg pain. The last year it's been more constant. It's going further down. It's going onto the sole of my foot or the lateral border of my foot now. Okay, and it's wholly possible to have ridiculous pain in the presence of a compressive radiculopathy and vice versa. Okay, so you have the chemical reaction of the nerve as well. Okay, because sometimes I thought that's definite, that's coming back as an S1 disc, that's it, it's going straight to Eugene or straight to Fraser. And then you go, oh, right, okay. <laughs> it's not. So, aggregating and easing factors, I kept it simple there, but they vary, they vary widely from patient to patient. Cough, sneeze, maybe positive a leg pain, and if they're bad or bowel or sad anaesthesia, if they've got a large disc, then obviously you're already on the red alert for the quad equina yeah, symptoms. So what can they have? They can have poor posture. Everybody's got poor posture. Uh, reduced or increased lordosis, loss of movement and function. Uh, movement loss is usually asymmetrical. Straight leg raise it can be positive uh, for leg pain. And a cross straight leg raise is positive for leg pain. That's just letting you know it's a slightly bigger disc there than you thought there would be. And neurologically, it should be altered in relevant ne uh, dermatome, myotome, and the reflex is reduced or absent. And there we go. There's a nice... That's almost like I've drawn that on with a black marker, isn't it? I may well have. <laughs> Who knows? OK. Don't ask me how I did that. That was a mistake. Maybe my daughter helped me with that one. OK, so that's showing on that lesion there that there's an L4 squish on the left-hand side. It's probably the nicest way to put it. OK, so again, what we're going to do with them... If you think, do you know what, I think that we could get there with physiotherapy, the leg pain's not much of a, a, a problem here, then discharge them to physio, or I would re review them back after the physio, or sometimes what I'll do is I'll leave it open, and then if I'm referring to you guys, I'll say, you know, let me know if they're not getting anywhere, let me know and I'll see them back, instead of giving them an appointment which they, they maybe not need. Uh, if the MRI is positive and it fits in, with the clinical symptoms and the clinical findings, that patient can then go forward to be counselled uh, for a discectomy. And if the MRI is a bit iffy, you could again consider doing a nerve root block, and which is therapeutic and diagnostic. It lets you know that if you go in at that level and do a surgical procedure, then you've got a better chance of success. And it's not because the consultants like to notch one up on, you know, on the sticks but they want to do the best for the patient. I'm not going to put them under a procedure like that unless they know there's a really good chance that they're going to make a difference for them. Okay. And on to cervical myelopathy. 
I put this one in because, as I said earlier on, I have had a patient that presented and had been referred with a bit of back pain, a bit of pain going down the leg, weakness in the leg. Um, and it was only when I was questioning them and actually saw them walk into the clinic, I thought they've got quite a shuffling, staggery gait, and they start saying, you're tripping over anything. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm doing that. <coughs> and then they started to, I started to find out they had upper, upper limb symptoms as well. Um, so it's always a kind of watch and look out for everything scenario. I've been caught out before. So a bit like the uh, lumbar spine, it just happens, but it happens higher up, but it can have more effects. Um, so you can have a gradual onset with increasing disability, pain, numbness, paresthesia, and hands, either unilateral, bilateral, electric shock type symptoms, clumsiness, weakness, long track signs with the weakness, as I said, in the lower limbs, ataxic gait. They may have, they could have poor static dynamic balance, as I said, ataxic gait, may have upper motor neuron signs with the clonus, plantar responses, and positive neuro signs in the upper limbs. The management type for this person would be, if you had any concerns about it at all, the MRI scan it. Uh, we tend to see the MRI scans back uh, before we then refer them on to the neurosurgeons. Okay, and this is an MRI of a patient who had had a previous fusion. And I think the history behind this one was they were then referred in to the pain clinic and they were assessed in the pain clinic, and the pain clinic picked up that they had a progressive possible myelopathy, scanned it, and this person went on to undergo a full C2 to C5 laminectomy with instrumentation to stop the deterioration in his symptoms. <coughs> okay, so I'm not gonna go through this because I don't need to, uh, but I would always bang on about question, question, question till you're blue in the face. You need to have enough information so that you can start your clinical reasoning process and do the best for the patient and know that you're going down the right lines with the patient. Okay. Um, and also by questioning, it does alert you to obviously the red flags, yellow flags, blue flags. Okay. I'm not going to go through that. You don't need that. And the examination, the only other thing I see is, and I think probably if somebody comes into me in the clinic, and I know the, the national guidelines are if they have pain going down below their knee, you do a full neurological examination. I do it as stat, just purely because by the time they've got to me in the clinic, if I want them to buy on board for me saying, look, you know, I understand you're in pain, but there's nothing I can do for you. This is mechanical pain. Um, then I think they feel as if they've had a thorough examination. They may have had that done three times before, but their expectations when they come into the clinic you know, some of them are banging the MRI stick and you're having to then roll back from that and say, hold on a second, we don't really need all that at the moment. Check your circulation, check your plantar response as well, just in case you've got a sneaky upper motor neuron that's sneaked in there and you need the services of somebody else. And that's my references. And that's a nice speech. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>